It's a show so relaxed, we don't have an opener. That's right. It's Shore Leave, Mm -hmm. where we take a little break by deeply researching some topics to talk about. No. Oh, I I went deep on mine. Oh, yeah. Well, don't do that. My only rest is work. uh, (laughs) So maybe I'm doing it wrong, but we're back. We are back. To talk about some topics. That we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't have to be related to Japan. Right. It would help if they were. Mm -hmm. Turns out they are. Turns out. Uh, But that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. (laughs) (sighs) Here in the the interregnum. That really means it should be uh, interquinum. Oh, okay. Regium. Okay. I have no idea. Regina is queen, right? Yeah. Because the makes reg sense. part means that's that's king. You're between kings, right? Isn't that what interregnum means? I am going to guess that you are correct because it sounds correct. I just don't know hundred percent sure. So Luckily there you go. this is a show where we can look things up while we're just talking. Yeah. That is true. So that is a thing that we do uh, on the show. Uh, you're you're trying to vamp, but the point is, is that this is surely they don't need to vamp. <laughs> I do feel like I'm right. What I gotta be right. I, I do feel like with the the theme song for this show, like maybe we need to sing like a sea shanty or something like that at some point. What? <laughs> that's t- that's two thousand five. <laughs> no, that was the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Don't you remember that? We don't gotta. Yeah. Whatever. Oh, was it? Yes. Oh, it was like that's how long ago who it even, was. Who even knows? Yeah. Well, the word rain itself comes from from the root king, right? From Latin rex. Sure. So I think you are probably correct. All right. What a great what a great what a great hour of podcast delight. Wow. <laughs> to tell me what we're talking about today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about uh, Japan just recently uh, rolled back a lot of their COVID traveling restrictions for foreign tourists. So that's oh. what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, so Japan opened back up to foreign tourists on October 11th. So My tale also begins with the restriction of travel. Oh, well, but there you t- go. Tell yours, though. Okay. Um, so they started... Uh, Japan had very strict travel restrictions for, um, like, the beginning of COVID and, like, for foreigners. And they didn't start to ease up on them until, I think it was June of this year. Um, And they just kind of slowly started amping them up. Um, Before this, there was a cap of 50,000 daily arrivals for foreign tourists. Um, And foreign tourists also needed a visa to enter the country and they could only enter if they were part of a guided tour group. Okay. So I think people felt like that was pretty limiting. Um, was that because the person was going to make sh- sure they went, they didn't go anywhere they shouldn't or that they were, you know, behaving themselves? Or was that because a Japanese travel agency or or company was definitely you know going to see the benefit of people coming in well, this has hurt people this has hurt the travel industry in japan so it hasn't definitely right, but this but this is going to help this is the thing that's going to help them now right the, yeah but the early people coming it'd be like if we said uh no foreign visitors to america mm-hmm. now but except if they are disney plus past members but now uh, you don't have to come and in the, as, as a guided tour. Well, right, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying before. Yeah. Right. They were, you know, making a little money before. I don't think they were. Right. There really weren't right. that many tourists. Well, it's more than zero. It's more than, okay, you you got me there. It is definitely more than zero. <laughs> okay. um, but right. it's it's not a lot. And plus you have a lot of travel agencies and that's, anyways. Yeah. Um, I think it was more to try to 
you know, keep an eye on like where foreigners are and like restrict <laughs> yeah. their whereabouts and that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know. People, I, a lot of YouTubers that I, I follow who uh, live in Japan didn't like it because they felt like, <laughs> well, they, they live there, so they don't have to worry. But like, they're like, this isn't inviting for people. <laughs> Right. I got to make content here. It's not. Come on. Right. Um, but but so Japan is hoping that this is a will be a welcome boost to their economy. Uh, the yen is at its lowest value against the U.S. dollar that, as it has been in like six months. I think right now um, it's about one U.S. dollar is currently about one hundred and forty five yen. So um, that's the yen is pretty weak. Uh, and. Japan is also the last G7 country to loosen its COVID restrictions. And they were getting a lot. One reason why they opened up besides boosting the economy is because they were getting a lot of pressure from the other G7 countries to, like, you're making us look bad. Um, <laughs> so they're, these travel restrictions that they have now as of October 11th align with other G7 countries. Um and uh, so there were quite a few foreigners in Japan back in 2019 um, before COVID hit. There were around 32 million foreign foreigners visited Japan. Um, in 2022, uh, it's just over half a million foreigners have visited. That's a good. So what happened to the foreigners that were in Japan when the lockdown started? Well, I guess it depends if, you know, if, if they, you, got if a you visa, live there, if you've got visa. a visa, work visa, right, but exactly. If you, so can you leave? For So a lot of the YouTubers that I follow, I'm going back to that, um, they couldn't leave for a while because they weren't sure if they could get back in or not. Right. That's right? what I'm wondering. Yeah, no, but like they started traveling again earlier this year um, and because they were, they got the guarantee that they could come back in. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. But like for a while there, they were scared to leave because they were like, I, I might, you know, my stuff is all here, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> Nobody wants to watch a cares. YouTube video about me going to McDonald's in America. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's not exciting. So yeah. Um. And it's been predicted. They're really hoping that this. They they've already seen an uptick in like flights and reservations and that sort of thing but it's been predicted that international travel demand won't fully recover until around somewhere in 2025 huh. um so we'll see uh, a couple of other things that i read um was like a lot of places in the hospitality industry in japan like they um uh, during the pandemic, they had to let people go because they weren't getting like a lot of hotels. Sure. They weren't getting a lot of uh, people to come and stay in them. And so um, they're kind of worried that they're going to be understaffed. And so <sighs> Japanese, that's a concern. Nobody wants to work. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that sort of thing, that kind of rhetoric is going around Japan or at all or not. Yes. Um, but uh, a, a YouTuber mentioned too that something that was kind of shady that they noticed recently is since um, uh, Japan has opened up that the hotel prices have gone way up. Huh. And like while uh, the pandemic has been going on, they've been able to travel to, you know, pretty decent sized hotel, like decent hotels and like pay maybe like, 50 60 bucks a night and now it just like, it, it just went way up it's like come on guys that holographic velociraptor just bought a boat yeah right exactly Is yeah that a holographic boat <laughs> yeah i i wonder how the the love hotels are jacking up their prices too uh, yeah you know, i i would love to know as well yeah um i would say probably less yeah, I would say probably less, yeah, too. Because they're like, look, man, I didn't make money either way. Yeah. That's, uh, well, I guess it's good to know that profit knows no nationality. Yeah, I know. Um, I mean, you do have to be careful. Some love hotels, like, they will lock you in the room. And that's like, <laughs> like, 
or like I want to go out like I was watching a video once and like they ordered room service and they you don't get a key because you just get you you're like I'm going to this room I paid for this room and it's like you get there and it's unlocked and then you go in and they lock you in and then they couldn't get out I, I don't know. You had to call the front desk to be let out and stuff like that. So what, like if the, the fire alarm goes off, all the doors go open, right? I would think so. What do you do? Yeah. But it's just, it's kind of, it's weird. It's a weird thing. Um, I feel like security is kind of weird because if you don't get a key to your room and everything too, anyways. Um <laughs> It's 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 different, but um, one thing that there you know pe- a lot of people in Japan are concerned about is that foreigners um, won't be as mindful about wearing their masks in Japan uh, as Japanese people are. Like, right. so um, there ha- was never a mask mandate in Japan at all during the pandemic. But they they didn't need to have one because the vast majority of people just wear it anyways. Um, there's going to be some people who don't, but um, so um, masks I think are typically required a lot of places indoors still in Japan. Um, but a lot of people you you walk around the street, a lot of people are wearing them outdoors too. Sure. So I guess that's something to be mindful of. You know, when you travel to Japan, wear your mask. And also just be respectful of, like, the hotel's policies, like, wherever you are and everything. And, like, if they have, like... Stay locked in your room. (laughs) No, don't stay locked in your room. But, like, like if they have, like, COVID um, restrictions and that sort of thing, just be mindful of that and respectful and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, But it's exciting because they kept rolling back their restrictions, but just slightly... And it's like, when are you guys? When nobody wants to go on these guided tours, that's not so much fun, <laughs> you know. It doesn't sound like a fun time. And it's like, oh, when we let we allow foreigners to travel the country with more freedom, they want to come here. How about that? So, anyways, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, how much, how many more people will travel. To Japan now that it's open. So isn't that what Japan's always wanted, though? What you can come to our country, but it, it's like a, you treat it like a museum. We'll just guide you everywhere. I mean, in some ways, I think yes. <laughs> no, don't know yelling on our yeah public transit and throwing up outside of our sake bars. Yeah, just uh, and we're walking and we're walking. Y- yes, I do <laughs> oh, look, think the yes. Palace and yes, we're walking. Very do... awesome. <laughs> Right, I do think get out there, of here. I do think there's an <laughs> awful lot of that. But I do think this will help Japan's uh, economy a lot more than some of the other things that they suggested. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you or not. What, like shower with a friend or something? What are they? <laughs> no, but like there was this article or, or no, it wasn't just an article. It was it was something it was from the government. The government, the Japanese government, I'm pretty sure it was the Japanese government, was encouraging young people to drink more alcohol to boost the economy. <laughs> it's like, are uh, you serious? Yeah. How much how much beer do you want me to drink? Yeah. You know, it's not the same as like people like traveling and that sort of I don't know. Yeah. On a scale from, uh, you know, uh, freshman uh, fraternity pledge to Japanese salary man on Friday night, right? To uh, Wisconsinite, like where where do we go? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Zero well, and ten. also it's like super irresponsible to encourage people to drink a lot more than they already are. No, <laughs> they well they have a different. So every beer ad here, I'm talking like beer. I'm talking like. Three two beer mm-hmm. has to be like <laughs> Santa jet ski seems pretty great, right? Beer, you gotta be responsible. Yeah, right. Be responsible. Yeah, uh, and that's because probably of our litigious culture. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have quite the litigious culture over there, and I don't know why. Is it I'm too ashamed to sue you, or is it because they know that like most lawsuits, you know, they they have a real institutional kind of bias there, so it's probably going to be like, well, you shouldn't have drank all that sake. Yeah. So their ads maybe don't need to have the whole, but guys, be careful. Maybe it's it it 
it's more like because they have a lot. There's a lot of we've talked about this before. There's a lot of shame in Japanese culture. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that here. <laughs> well, no, yeah, not no, to the same extent. That's the big difference. Not to the same extent. We don't got that. Yeah. And 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 also, I think that you know, just this this idea of like, um, the individual over here in America, and like, so you have to be responsible, and blah blah blah. blah. Whereas it's more of like you're supposed to be mindful of everybody in Japan when you're out socializing. So, like, keep the drinking. You know, not to say that everybody does that. You see drunk people in Japan. You know, it's not like you're you're not going to see drunk people. They you sell know I mean? booze and vending machines. I know. <laughs> well, I, I think that like you can't. We could we couldn't have that here. It would be booze and vending machines. No, it would be no. Armageddon twenty four seven. It would be like you get but, so, high schoolers getting buzzed going to school. So they're uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, so shop classes is, is early. You gotta mm-hmm. you know get out on the run. Um, so there is so they have that because of their responsibility, but because of that, you are always going to have people who can't or refuse to be responsible, and so therefore you have you know. Uh, piles of puke, but piles of puke per sidewalk tile are much lower there yes. than they are here. True. Yeah. Yes. It's kind of like the, um, I don't know. It's like the, well, I don't have any numbers on this, but we're so, it's weird because we're weird about sex. Yes. Here, this isn't even my thing. This is an extra for you. <laughs> we're weird about sex. And so we get weird about sex. I don't know if there's anybody keeping like, mole women in basements in Japan. Wow. Don't have basements in Japan. Uh, well, we got that going on here. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and we're weird about sex. They are both weird and not weird about sex. And maybe it has to do with the, with the shame threshold because they're like, uh, do whatever you want. I, I don't want to see it. Yeah, right. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then some things have, you know, reached out into like, if an adult bookstore gets pushed to you know, the tracks across from the airport here, um, it's in a train station. (laughs) Like maybe not the busiest train station, but it's just like next to uh, the McDonald's or the uh, FAO Schwartz or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they're like, but you like just, you know, keep it, you know, do it on your own. Right. So I don't know, whatever. There's something to say for even the, even the most pervert pervert is like, well, but I'll do this at home. Right. (laughs) (laughs) In the privacy of my own domicile. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. foreign people can see those perverts now. That's right. Japan's opening back up. That's right. <laughs> well, speaking of shame, it's time to throw your shame away. Just like the subject of my section, the gay electro ronin of Japan. Oh, my goodness. The Leonardo da Vinci meets Don Draper of Japan. Uh, a guy named Haraga Genai. All right. Let me tell you about this guy. Kay. He's pretty incredible. And I believe that he is known in Japan. Americans are always, uh, we, we don't really care about other foreigners' accomplishments generally. Huh. Uh, and especially have, being on the uh, other side of the East-West divide, uh, as far as learning here goes, I'm surprised I never heard of this guy because he was very influential. And like I said, he is known and uh, honored in Japan. But sure. uh, a very interesting guy from a very interesting time. He was born in 1728. And he was born um, the third son of a very low-ranking samurai. Okay. This is a samurai family that was defeated by the Takeda clan. Okay. In those times, in the post, this is the cleanup after the uh, the beginning of the Tokugawa, you know, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. Uh, the K- Takeda clan was out kicking ass, and uh, they um, sent these guys down, and so they had to kind of flee south, uh, and so they ended up in Tsunuki province in Kagawa. Okay. Which is down south. And so they were like samurai in name only. Uh, they were um, basically farmers, okay. uh, very low ranking, low income. Uh, despite that, though, still a noble. So this third son, never going to see any authority or anything like that. He still had a, a teacher. And so he was a prodigy. He was a very smart, gifted child. He studied um, haiku poetry and Confucianism and uh, Kekajiku, you know, the Hanging Scrolls, and uh, also studied natural sciences and herbology, 
uh, at a med- medical doctor uh, in town there. Interesting. And eventually learned so much that he became a pharmacologist huh. and an herbalist at a feudal lord's castle there. Okay. So he was like, you know, an apothecary, basically. All right. Um, he later then became, um, was given the official uh, position uh, of the herb cultivator of the local uh, daimyo. Now, that's at, at the age of 18. Uh, a couple of years later, his father died and he became the head of the family. So going oh. from like, I'm never going to be anything to being totally in charge. Wow. Yes. Four years later, he said, screw you guys. I'm out of here. Uh, and he completely gave up his family's title and became like a self-imposed Ronin, essentially. He just okay. said, I'm not part of this family anymore. And he left and he went straight to Nagasaki, baby. Okay. You know why? Why? They got that hot Rangaku there. Okay. Rangaku is foreign knowledge, right? Yeah. Nagasaki is the only port yeah. that is allowed to trade outside of Japan. And almost all of that trade is exclusively the Dutch. Sure. So sailors from the Netherlands bring foreign goods. Um, you can see in um, the movie Silence that we watched mm-hmm. that this is very heavily regulated. This is all after the 1630s when the Japanese shogunate shut everything down. And we had the isolationist policy that lasted until the beginning of the Meiji Restoration, right? Yeah. And so Dejima is the Dutch enclave there. And so he went to Nagasaki and he said, I want all that. Give me all that foreign knowledge. Dutch East Indies, teach me all the stuff. I want to learn all this foreign science. He even learned Dutch so he could read foreign books. Huh. So he's just going, nom, 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 nom. and I'm not exactly sure where he's getting all this stuff from. Because like we see in um, Silence, they're like, take, they're burning a lot of this stuff that comes in. But they are stockpiling some of it. Mm -hmm. So somehow he got to somebody and was able to learn and and read all all this stuff. And so he increased like all his knowledge of this and then basically just started like touring the country and just like learning everything that he could, studying science all over the country. And using this knowledge, he developed uh, a couple different inventions and sort of like techniques that nobody else knew about before. He got his hands on a Dutch static electricity generator huh. uh, that was broken and he fixed it and like refined it. Okay. And so um, it was like, this is basically like a wooden box and then there's like a wheel uh, with like wool or something that creates friction, which creates static electricity and then a Leyden jar. And a Leyden jar is like a device that basically can store electricity and act like a battery. Interesting. So he called it the Elekiter. <laughs> and he would use it for like exhibitions and like as a therapy device. I guess you like, you know, oh, I shock my, shock my shoulder. Oh, it feels good. <laughs> and he, um, he used his art skills to like, you know, take notes and write and design. And he, um, you know, was, became an architect and would um, draw and sketch all these things. Um, he designed like a bamboo toy that was one of the earliest propeller designs in the world. That's cool. Uh, it was never turned into anything. Uh, right. We didn't have the resources for that, but that's one of the reasons that uh, finding that later, they called him, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci of, of Japan. <laughs> um, he was, uh, he went to Edo eventually. Mm-hmm. And in Edo, he studied under a um, herbalist and master there. And he um, was one of the first people to cultivate ginseng okay uh in japan interesting so like at this point ginseng is getting their stuff from china and from korea and he was one of the first people to um to find out how to develop the uh techniques for growing like ginseng uh regionally that's cool yeah so um that was a big thing there um he also uh was into mining so maybe throw uh he he's finding the color so maybe he's like a Hearst type character here. Oh my gosh. He discovered iron in Izu province. Huh. And so then, you know, once you discover this, you, you know, you're in charge of it. And so he became the broker and he established a mining venture. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, and became an official in the Tokugawa shogunate. And so got, that was all well and good, but that's money. That's yeah. money for, for the experiments. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And right. So, and so now he's working on all these experience, uh, experiments and he's doing all this. He, um, can, he had, knew a lot about chemistry, and so he developed a um, a technique to improve the efficiency of charcoal furnaces. 
Okay. Which, and I didn't like, maybe a lot of people were working on this, but that specifically would improve J- Japan's ability to metal work, right? Like they know one way, basically like they make swords, right? Yeah. They had that down. And that's a technique that is, you know, passed through swordsmiths and, and like smelters and things like that. But mm-hmm. like he, you know, d- he um, improved the efficiency of charcoal furnaces, which allowed for like the construction of like more industrial type things. Now, at this point, they're not like industrializing the whole hog. Right. But all of these techniques are already laid in by the time that they decide to start doing this. And so he um, there's like a certain type of like river boat uh, that he helped design. Hmm. Uh, that improved trade and that sort of thing. Like this guy was just like, he was all over the map. Yeah, it sounds like it. And he also... In a positive way. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, he was literally all over the map. Uh, he also... Um, <laughs> so he would travel back and forth from Edo to Nagasaki because he always had to go and pick up the new science juice. Sure. And uh, one time he was traveling through his home province and he found a large deposit of clay there. And so he petitioned the government to, once again, flip that shit and set up workshops and kilns that would allow Japan to increase the production of its own stoneware. Because, again, at this point, they're still relying on the mainland for a lot of their stoneware, Mm. especially the, the fancy stuff. Sure. And so they changed that. They started creating their own pots and own art. And he used his chemical knowledge, his knowledge of chemistry, and also Western and Japanese aesthetics to create his own pottery style called Genai Ware. I've heard of that before. Yeah. And it is basically, um, it's a lot of different styles, a lot lot of different um, expressions of it, but it it involves these like vivid green glazes, Mm -hmm. uh, these kind of like um, um, enameled sort of uh, shiny sort of green colors. Uh, and, and art styles. Um, he was an expert on foreign art. That's one of the things that he always did when he went back to uh, Nagasaki is he'd buy uh, art and books. And uh, he mentored the retainer of a lord that he was working for. Hmm. That guy was Odin Naotake, who ended up creating the Akita Ranga school of Western-influenced paintings. Interesting. So while uh, Europe has yet to create a bunch of prints copying Japanese ukiyo-e. <laughs> right. He's helping Japanese create uh, oh. essentially the deck the walls art sure. for for rich Japanese people. Sure. Uh, ripping off, uh, you know, Western styles. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also wrote a bunch of books. Wow. This is incredible. So, Where did this guy sleep? I have no... Well, I don't know. Maybe he invented Japanese cocaine. I don't know. <laughs> uh, one of his books uh, was called... On farting. Wow. <laughs> or Hohi Ron, the theory of farting. Oh, my God. And he puts himself in this book. It's a satire. Uh-huh. Uh, he has a debate with a samurai over an, over a peasant who had become a popular entertainer called a fartist. Wow. Now, I'm not sure if, like, that's a pun in English, right? Yeah, Maybe I Maybe there's know. some kind of pun that works the same. Uh, in Japan. I don't know. And so this guy would like, you know, he would perch himself on this bridge and he would like, you know, play songs with his butt and stuff like that. Oh my God. <laughs> and the, the samurai would be like, this is ridiculous. This guy is just farting. This is just the air that poop makes. What is this? But Genai is like, this is a commendably unique talent, you know, and he's, and I'm not sure that he really believes that he's putting himself in the story. He's right. a character in the story, but it is a commentary mm-hmm. on the commercialization of mm-hmm. art, sure. which he has a perspective on mm-hmm. because he is somebody who has absorbed foreign art. He's compared it to the national art. And I don't, I don't know how he did, compares the two exactly, but he's basically saying like, you know, art is in the eye of the beholder, Sure, which I think is, you know, I'm not sure where they were at in terms of art appreciation and art commentary, but that's something that we say now yeah. you know, in the West. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, he had another book called uh, Nina Shigusa or Rootless Grass. Okay. And it's the story of, uh, it takes place in hell. It's the story of Enma, the Lord of Hell, who falls in love with Kin, uh, Kinkunojo, Kin, Kinkunojo? Okay. Kinkunojo-i. Who is a onagata? Okay. 
that is a male actor who plays a yes. female role in a kabuki show. Interesting. And so Enma becomes so uh, infatuated with this Onagata mm-hmm. that he sends a kappa to to go retrieve them and bring them back to hell so he can marry them. Okay. And the kappa, uh, of course, is a mischievous, mischievous spirit. Yeah. So the kappa's like, what do I do? I drown people. I'm going to drown them. <laughs> So when I drowned him, they'll die and they'll go to hell and then the uh, job's done. Yeah. Send him off by FedEx. No yeah, problem. Right. But the kappa, this anagata is so beautiful that the kappa falls for the anagata uh, as well and doesn't want to see them go to hell. I see. So the kappa brings back a less attractive anagata. <laughs> like thinking that they wouldn't notice? Yes. Oh my goodness. So Enma's like, this isn't who I asked for. Yeah. And you're fired. And so Enma goes up to the mortal realm himself mm. to find Kinkunojo. Okay. And the the recap is is a little uh, you know yada yada this part, but apparently Enma then runs into a, a hero, you know, a, a young man who's a hero, okay, who uh, has a like a you know devil went down to Georgia kind of thing with Enma and defeats Enma that way. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's like a, a satire of something. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what it's supposed to be a satire of. Yeah. Uh, it's also interesting to note that uh, Hell is in the midst of a large construction project. So he's putting what? a little bit of his own life in there because that's uh, funny. he was a, a foreman and an architect as well. Uh, he also has uh, a, a famous book uh, on the – basically on the um, – the, the the joys of uh, love with the same sex. Okay. Because that was that was his thing. He was full on into that. That's cool. Homosexuality, as we've talked about in Japan, uh, the attitudes have changed over the years. Yeah. Uh, but at this time, um, homosexuality, uh, sex with somebody of the same sex, um, had been around for millennia oh, sure. in Japanese culture. Um, and bisexuality was essentially like fine. You know, mm-hmm. there were no real laws against it. Um, you samurai definitely at least had to have a wife to pass on their lineage, you know, or any royalty. Um, but, you know, basically you could just, you know, date whoever. Right. And young samurai were often in relationships with older samurai. Sure. And that was seen as like, you know, mentorship, mm-hmm. uh, training in the art of devotion. Uh, this is wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. Right. Though hanging out with women made you a sissy. So <laughs> you could, you could, ha- you could date That's a woman, so weird. be married to one, have sex with one, but you spend time with dudes. That's so weird. So even in your bisexual paradise, you got a little, you got a little chauvinism in there. Yeah. Because you have to. Hmm. That's at, disappointing. At this time in the late 17th century, homosexuality, uh, homosexuality became very popular. Okay. That's when it really started to like uh, pump up a little. Okay. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. And so one of his works was all about like how great it is and, uh, you know, people that date women, pff, they don't know what they're, they don't know what they're, they're talking what they're about. Forget about that. <laughs> and it's had a lot of uh, a poetry and stories about that. Um, I said Don Draper before. You did. Here's why. He used his writing ability and his artistry to, uh, you know. To sell a little bit. He wrote about the commercial commercialization of art. He wasn't above putting sure. it into practice himself. Okay. Uh, he actually um, <laughs> he actually popularized uh, Doyo no Ushi, the summer day of the ox. Okay. Which is between July 20th and August 7th, somewhere in there. It is a festival and is the most popular time to eat eel in Japan. That was all him. Really? Yes. That is the day. On that day, uh, the eel is through. We're going to need a lot of eel for that day. Make the order now. The eel yeah. sales are through the roof. Okay. And it all started when his friend had a grilled eel shop. Okay. And asked him uh, if his friend had any ideas on how to sell more eel. We got to sell this through. Uh-huh. And so uh, Genai's idea was to put up a sign that said, today is the midsummer day of the ox. So you got to get your eel. And everybody's like, what does that mean? <laughs> well, there had long been a superstition in Japan about eating things uh, that start with you 
on the day of the ox was good luck. Really? Yeah. Interesting. And so basically his idea is to, and I'm, again, you, the sound you, not the you in, in English, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the sign emphasized, probably underlined that fact that, hey, unagi mm-hmm. starts with a U. Mm-hmm. And so it just like picked up and suddenly everybody wanted to get eel. Now, I don't know how he made a profit on like one day or like one week out of the year. Right. But that's really interesting. We did all our business. It's like Christmas. We did all our business. Well, that's what it, it honestly it reminds me of the guy who started, who worked for KFC and started the, the not necessarily a rumor, but started the, uh, the idea that everybody in America eats KFC for Christmas day. Yeah. And that just took off. Yeah. That's what it reminds me of. Yeah. That's so funny. That guy got an extra carton of cigarettes. <laughs> For, At least. For his bonus. Jeez. Uh, in uh, the Japanese Madison Avenue. <laughs> uh, he also helped sell toothpaste or tooth powder at that time. Okay. So um, there was a company uh, called Sosekiko that sold uh, tooth powder. And he had a couple different ideas. Uh, one of them was uh, don't sell it individually in bags. Sell it in bulk. So sell it 20 bags to a box and then give people a little discount. So instead of selling wow. it for a dollar a bag, sell it for like seventeen fifty for twenty bags. Oh my god! And then people are like, "Well, I'm getting the deal." And then you're just moving the you're moving the weight that way. Uh huh. Which is like, that's Smart. that's like that people do that still today. It's a big brain you got move. Yeah. Ten hot dogs in a package. You got eight buns in a package. I hate that. Right. I hate it. So you're always going to be on the loop. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He also wrote a pamphlet for the product. And there's no direct translation, but like the idea I got from it was it was basically like an aw shucks soft sell. It was like, hey, you know, you probably use tooth powder, but if you used Sosakiko tooth powder, you're going to be happy. No. I don't, I look, I don't know what's in it, but they tell me that it's the best. So you should probably try it out. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It's so great. Oh my gosh. You know, it's like, it's like they're toasted. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's like it, it made no claims about the product. It's just saying, hey, this is, this is pretty good. You're going to be impressed. Yeah. It's like, that's, that is modern advertising. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's 14 things that we can't tell you about it because of the FDA. Right. Or we have to have a guy go, uh, if you try this, you'll bleed out of your butthole. Right. Uh, kind of in <laughs> sato voce. But they're saying like, this is the best. Yeah. Make that little cloud that follows you around. Just not be there sometimes. Yeah, right. Antidepressants. <laughs> so it's genius. So yeah, he was a uh, uh, hard drinking, uh, boy loving, uh, ad writing, uh, electro shock giving, uh-huh. uh, cool guy. Uh, it's never, it's never derailing. I it's mean, never derailing. This guy was like super talented until it derailed. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, all it all came crashing down. This is uh, the, uh, the 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 middle act. That there was no last act of the behind the music. Uh, he killed some guys. <laughs> Whoa! Yes. What? Uh, so nobody really knows. I did not see that coming. He was arrested for killing some guys. And because they didn't have uh, CSI, and I guess they didn't like do the first 48 where they just break somebody down, uh, we don't know exactly what happened. There's a couple different theories. One of them is that he killed one of his disciples because he had, I forgot to mention, a lot of people that studied under him Uh and also maybe uh, practiced the art of devotion, who can say? (laughs) Uh, Say no more. And uh, that he killed one of them. Uh, in like a drunken sort of self-pitying rage over not getting the recognition he deserved, <laughs> which oh my gosh, I can kind of understand because wow. we don't know who he is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And even at the time, maybe he felt like he wasn't getting enough recognition. Um, he certainly was compensated monetarily. Uh, he had his clay yeah. mine. Uh, he had an iron mine. Uh, he had all that tooth powder money. Yeah. He's living on tooth powder money. Yeah. Uh, It's also said that he may have killed some workers who were working on a uh, feudal lord's mansion. He had been uh, contracted to uh, renovate and repair a feudal lord's mansion. And he might have shown up uh, to work drunk and got confused and thought that um, somebody had stolen his blueprints. And so he like killed two guys. I should mention, he carried a sword around all the time. He was really good with sword. Oh my gosh. And so um, he got arrested and he was in prison uh, for like a year and uh, died of tetanus. Oh, my gosh. In prison. 
Or did he? What? Did he die? What? They held a funeral. They wanted to hold a funeral, but the shogunate said no. So they held a memorial service. No body, no tombstone. Huh. And so theories persist to this day that possibly he was spirited out of prison. Oh, okay, sure. And continued to live his fabulous life somewhere else. But if he continued to live, wouldn't we have known about it? Because this guy like seems Possibly. like there's no earthly way he could just live a quiet life and Possibly. not do anything amazing. Maybe, well, maybe he learned his lesson. He took all that tooth powder money and he, he, he there's a, there's a uh, undiscovered lab in the mountains somewhere where he's doing a, he's Japanese Tesla thing. You know, he's got like a cyber drone or something like that. Oh we don't God. know. He's still alive somewhere. Right? Uh, so they said that he couldn't have a funeral, but they did have a, a, a grave and a memorial put up uh, at Asa Kusabashi. But after the great Kanto earthquake, that was moved to Itabashi. Okay. So there is still a, a grave in Shido to this day Okay. for him. Uh, behind his grave is the grave of Fukusuke, his Long-time manservant. Okay. And also uh, a monument with an epitaph by Genpaku, his lifelong friend. Really? They were roommates. <laughs> I know, right? Just come on. <laughs> now, Genpaku is a physician and scholar who is known for uh, being one of the founders of Rangaku. He was one of these guys that was like the curator of this knowledge that came in huh so yeah he was a big deal that's cool so anyway uh yeah uh, today his grave is a 12 minute lo- walk from the manami senju station on the hibiya line uh it's not open to the public which i think is interesting why are they afraid a, of vandalism or possibly like but it's also you know maybe it's just part of a non-public you know cemetery hmm. uh, but uh, so okay. not all cemeteries you can just walk around and do whatever so. i guess yeah uh, there's also a second grave um, at the um, at the family uh, castle or, or sure. house in Kagawa. Okay. That's cool. Well, what a fascinating guy. I can't believe he, he killed some guys. That's like I, I definitely did not see that coming. Well, I'll tell you. He has not been forgotten. Yeah. He has shown up in anime. Okay. And we're going to talk about it right now. All right. He... Often shows up uh, in historical anime that makes or, sense. or manga. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has been in some kind of not exactly historical <laughs> anime and manga. Uh, he was in the anime Reader Die. I've heard of that. Which is maybe on our list. I'm not sure if he's on our list or not, uh, Reader Die, but we got to put that on there. Yeah. And apparently in Reader Die, um, they clone historical legendary figures. It kind of sounds like Clone High. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to I want to watch it now. Okay. Uh in the anime, he uses his uh elikitir as a high-powered weapon and tries to destroy the White House. <laughs> oh my god. So, got to check that out. Oh my goodness. Put that on the list. <laughs> uh what else? He's uh, been in some video games, uh like the video game Live a Live, uh which is on the Nintendo Switch. Uh he was also in Demashita Powerpuff Girls Z which is the Japanese version of Powerpuff Girls. Uh, now there's something that uh, you you know that exists that you didn't before. No, I didn't know that. He's also in Digimon Adventure in the 13th episode of the first season. Really? A character named Genai, who is based on him. Interesting. Yeah. I saw some Digimon back in the day, but wow. Interesting. And apparently um, he appears in... Oh, God. All right. Well, anyway, uh, he's in... He's in uh, Critical Role. Okay. Uh, in the Call of Cthulhu. I don't know anything about Critical Role, but it's, it's popular. In the Call of Cthulhu RPG one shot, he uh, is a character is named uh, Gen- I don't know, Actually, I think it's just Ganai with his Elikatir. Okay, sure. Uh, in Critical Role. And then in the uh, ninth episode of the third season of Star Trek Discovery, there is a starship uh, named the USS Hiraga Ganai. <laughs> sure. Okay. I mean, I guess it wouldn't surprise me all the different ships, but uh, with people's actual names in uh, Star Trek. But So it's time to make him the star of something, right? 
Yeah, enough of this side character. The problem, featured well, in enough, like one enough of these girls in, in miniskirts, right? Like, we, I think we've talked about this before uh, on Sailor New, but like, anime, you know, somebody's got to pay for it, and a lot of people have to draw it. And so there's always the marketability aspect to it. Mm-hmm. And I think when you get something like a Mushishi, it's because they go, all right, this is one of those, this is a good story, we're going to make it, we're probably going to eat, you know, the cost of this because it's there's no merchandising. But then we turn around and it's another season of Genshin Impact or whatever, and we're just going to make money hand over fist. Yeah. Like the BBC does this, right? Because people the their citizenry pays for the tv so sometimes it's going to be something that you know we can sell daleks or something like that and make some money back uh but sometimes we're going to do bleak house and right. everybody's going to say it's great and it might win a bafta but we're not going to make any money off of this right so the next time a we're not making any money off of this comes around do a historical thing uh he made amazing devices so if you want to add a little elevated history a little sci-fi into it mm-hmm. uh that'd be fine but yeah let's get a um you know a, the story the life story of uh Haraga Genai yeah that'd be cool that's what i want to see yeah no i definitely watch that um with all of his his cadre of lovers and lifelong best friends <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> he had a lot of friends. Yeah, yeah. Got a lot of lovers that he calls friends. Yes. Uh, good with a drunken sword, but not too good. Maybe you don't have him kill anybody in the anime. I don't know. His uh, sword is, you know, electrified, so it hits you, but it's like... <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, it's like, watch out, he's drunk. <laughs> Get out of his way. Oh, what's Give new? him a lot of room. Uh, so yeah, I, I would totally watch that. I mean, just what a fascinating person, uh, kind of sounded like he wanted nothing to do with his family too, which is kind of interesting. Um, did you say he was the, the third son? Yeah. I don't know what happened to the first two. Yeah. What happened that like. You're the third son, and all of a sudden your dad dies, and then you're ahead of the family. Maybe the other two sons were like, no, no, he's yeah, he's the, he's the guy. <laughs> he does what he's doing. Either that or they died young, or, you know, yeah. before dad did. But then he takes like... off, and he's like, I'm coming up. Bah, bah. And yeah, like, right. oh, no, now we have to run this. Yeah, right. I don't know anything about farming. Yeah, right, exactly. I didn't study anything. <laughs> Why am I left holding the bag? Well, I'm not an electro gay Ronin. <laughs> <sighs> well, anyway, um, that's the show for this week. I'm going to talk about stuff. That we to talk about Japanese stuff. That's right. That's it. That's what. That's what we do. Do the things. Go. On shore leave. Yep. Yep. We do all the things. Do it. Oh, what am I doing? You're telling all the stuff and the things. Oh, um. Join us on our Discord. Yeah. Uh, where you can join in the conversation. People, we talk about all sorts of things. People know about it. All right. But some people do. some people are sleeping on it. They, yeah. Why why are you doing that? So wake come, up. Come join the fun. Sleep on it. And join the Discord. And if you are interested in uh, more shows like this or not like this, um, we have a couple shows over on our Patreon. Um one of them, Animatification, we talk about the first episode uh, in a randomly selected anime, like Mushishi, we talked about recently. Yeah. Uh, so you should talk, check that out. Um, we also uh, watch Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, the live action Sailor Moon, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, and follow us on social media. Why don't you? Um, we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I think we're still on Tumblr as well. Uh, so, um, we're either at noob underscore sailor or sailor underscore noob, but if you search for us, you'll find us. We're there. Also, if Patreon is too rich for your blood, we've got a coffee. Yes. Uh, would you like a coffee? I would like a coffee. It's at ko-fi.com forward slash just enough trope. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now the URL makes sense. You can find us there. Uh, if Patreon's too rich for your blood or you just want to give us a little something to say, hey, you're doing a good job, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, it's quick and easy, and it goes right to us. We recently received a very generous uh, coffee from user Ron, uh, and we appreciate 
that. Uh, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. And uh, yeah, hey, keep it coming. I mean, everything that we get just goes right back into the show, mm-hmm. uh, and then you hear it on the air. I can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear that coffee in there. Yeah, exactly. So check it out. Yeah. Uh, and join us next week where we will be talking about the very first episode of Sailor Moon Supers, yeah. the fourth season Saddle of up. Sailor Moon. <laughs> Lock and load. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so um, we hope you will join us then. And I am Mikan Hana. I'm Caliban. <laughs> Stay electro gay. <laughs>